про военную составляющую. Мы ситуацию на фронте Украины с Макс Бут, историк и наблюдатель для Washington Post. Hello, thank you for joining us live on TV Ring. Firstly, I would like to ask you about General Zeluzhny's rather grim assessments of the situation on the front lines, which took the media landscape by storm. Do you agree with his evaluation? I, mean, I think what General Zeluzhny said is an accurate summation of where the battlefield stands right now, which is that it is a stalemate. And I think it's very much to his credit that he is being honest about that and telling the truth. Uh, contrast that with the behavior of Russian generals, uh, Russian ministers, the Russian president, who lie to their people all the time. And General Zeluzhny is leveling with his people, leveling with the world, and is admitting that the Ukrainian counteroffensive this summer did not achieve as much as Ukraine had hoped. But that doesn't mean that Russia is going to win or that Ukraine is, is going to lose. In fact, Uh, I mean, if you look at the at the war from the larger perspective, Ukraine has already won a massive victory by holding off an invasion from Russia, which is a much larger and more powerful country. Uh, and in the process of that, Ukraine has actually taken back roughly half of the territory that Putin illegally seized in 2022. Uh, and so, and, and, and the Ukrainian state continues to function. It's more popular and more cohesive than ever. Uh, the issue now is, I think, you know, what does Ukraine do going forward? And, and frankly, at the moment, I don't think they have any choice but to continue fighting for their land, to continue fighting for their freedom, because there is no indication that Putin has given up his criminal designs on Russia. There is no indication that Putin wants to negotiate mm -hmm. seriously or to give up his dreams of destroying Ukraine. So Ukraine has to keep fighting for its freedom. And it certainly has the capability to continue doing that, because even though its counteroffensive has not succeeded, the Russians have also carried out multiple offensives uh, around Bakhmut and elsewhere, Avdivka most recently, which have also failed. So that's part of the stalemate. You are saying that the results of the counteroffensive did not meet the expectations of Ukraine and its Western allies. As I understand, the counteroffensive is now over, or would that be a wrong reading of the situation? That the counteroffensive is over and it is now time to assess its results. I'm not sure that the counteroffensive is in fact over. It seems to me that it's still continuing. General Zeluzhny in fact said that they were continuing with offensive action. I think there is an expectation that the offensive action will decrease over the winter, uh, but it's, you know, it remains a A, a dynamic battlefield, uh, and even though, even if Ukraine is not advancing on the ground, they've had tremendous success at sea. Uh, they've reopened the Black Sea to grain exports. They've heavily damaged the Russian Black Sea fleet, forcing them to pull out of Sevastopol, their historic harbor. Uh, and the Ukrainians, you know, now have more long-range weapons, so they can continue to target Russian logistics lines air bases and command posts in Crimea, which will do a lot of damage to the Russian position and will continue to cause heavy losses on the Russian side, even over the winter. Over the winter? Could you please elaborate on that? Taking into account the changes in weather conditions, how will the war change? What should we, as daily observers, expect to see? And more importantly, what should the Ukrainians who stayed in their homeland expect to see? Well, I think there's a likelihood that the Russians will try another offensive of their own because, remember, uh, Putin is up for re-election, quote-unquote, next year. There's no doubt what the outcome is going to be because Russia does not have free elections. But nevertheless, I think Putin wants to show some kind of military progress on the ground prior to his, quote-unquote, re-election. Um, and so I think there is an imperative for the Russian troops to try to mm -hmm. advance. And I think you will probably see more of these horrible meat grinder offensives of the kind we've seen in the past year, first in Bakhmut and more recently in Abdivka, where the Russians sacrifice tens of thousands of soldiers, mm -hmm. take only a few meters of ground. Uh, and I think that's, that's the most likely outcome over the winter. But again, I think what we're seeing on both the Russian side and the Ukrainian side is that the defensive, whichever side is on the defense, has an advantage in this type of warfare 
And while it's hard for the Ukrainians to advance, it's also very hard for the Russians to advance. General Zeluzhny, President Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials insist that Ukraine requires modern weaponry to effectively fight off the Russian invasion. Should they expect such weapons to be shipped to Ukraine in the foreseeable future? Well, I certainly think that the West should provide them with the weapon systems that they're asking for. We've already provided them quite a bit. I wish we had provided it earlier, for example. We've only provided the U.S. M1 Abrams tanks and the U.S. attack ms which are the long-range army missiles. We've only provided those in the last month or so. I wish we had provided them earlier. We've, we're now going to be providing F-16s. Again, I wish we'd done that a year ago, but I think the F-16s will be coming next year. So I think you will see an increase in Ukrainian capabilities. I think the real challenge for both sides is simply to provide enough ammunition for their forces because they are both using up ammunition and they're also using up drones at a very high rate. Yes, but when I ask about these weapons, I'm more so interested in the West's readiness to commit to sending them to Ukraine, about a desire to do so. Is there such a desire in the West in light of these, how should I say it, shady, if not outright negative, statements regarding Ukraine, taking into account the attitudes that you are a witness in firsthand being in the United States? Are NATO allies pressuring Ukraine to maybe consider peace talks? Are they withholding these modern armaments? I, I haven't seen that happening yet because I think there's a there's a recognition in the West that Putin has no desire for serious negotiations. So I don't think peace talks are going to get very far right now in terms of whether there is support for providing more weapons for Ukraine. I think that there is. Mm -hmm. I know that there is more opposition to Ukraine in the West than there was before, especially in the United States among Republicans. Uh, but I think it's still the case that in Congress and the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, about roughly two-thirds of the members still support aid to Ukraine. That's, you know, that's down from the level it was a year ago, but it's still about, you know, there are not many issues where you can get 60 percent or more of our, our elected representatives agreeing, and 60% and or more do agree on aid for Ukraine. So, uh, even though it's harder now than it was before, I do for us to continue supporting Ukraine and their fight for freedom. I would also like to ask you about the following. When you speak of the Russians' bloody and pinpoint attacks, for example, in Avdiivka, which we are all observing in terror, we are seeing incredible losses both in manpower and weaponry. Firstly, do you agree that the Russian losses are in fact as big as they are claimed to be? And secondly, do you expect a new wave of mobilization to take place in Russia, since Russia, or rather Vladimir Putin, does not intend to stop the war? I do think that the Russians are suffering very heavy losses in Avdivka and elsewhere. I mean, uh, they've certainly lost at least 200,000 casualties killed and wounded since the war began, possibly more. And these are the worst losses Russia has suffered in any conflict since World War II. And it's completely unnecessary because Ukraine was not threatening Russia. This is a war of aggression launched by Putin for no good reason. It's a, it's a tragedy and an error. I hope that Russia will, uh, will think better of it eventually. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, I think that there is uh, a, a real danger of another wave of mobilization because, you know, Putin is losing so many troops. He, you know, he had to resort to using convicts and mercenaries, but even the number of convicts and mercenaries is starting to run low, I think. So he probably will have to expand mobilization uh, and the war will take an even greater toll on the Russian people. And again, for no good reason. All of this sounds crazy, but thank you for joining us today. This has been Max Boot, military historian and observer for The Washington Post, live here on TV Rain from the United States. We discuss the situation on the front lines of the war between Ukraine and Russia. We operated in Russia for 12 years, and the government tried to get rid of us three times. They got us on the sixth day of the war in Ukraine. We left Russia, but we kept going. 
We have now decided to tell the truth about Russia, the war, and Russian society in English as well. Kherson is Putin's third major defeat in a row. What is wrong with the Russian army? Stories no one else can tell you. Hear it right from the source. Subscribe to our channel.